Hello again, everybody. We're going to move on here now to the renal and urinary tract infections. These are commonly tested. Uh, and it, some of these are things that you're going to probably run into on a weekly, at least a weekly basis if you're working in the ER or in the clinic. So this is something you probably have a good amount of familiarity with already, but it always helps to reacquaint ourselves. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And certainly feel free to subscribe to my channel and you will get uh, notifications as I put more and more videos up. We're going to talk about acute cystitis, commonly called a bladder infection. We'll talk about pyelonephritis. We'll talk about the perinephric abscess, which is fairly rare. And then we'll talk about asymptomatic bacteriuria and why that's important. This is the urinary tract. The thing that I want to point out here is that the urethra in a woman is fairly short. It's maybe a little bit longer than your pinky. Um, so it's, it's not long at all. And the problem with that is that it's much easier for bacteria to get into the bladder because it is a shorter period or shorter distance to go uh, versus the male whose urethra is roughly the same length as the woman's plus the distance of the penis. So you've got a much longer urethra regardless of the size of your penis. Um, some will have obviously longer than others, but it is always going to be longer than a woman. And so for that reason, men do not tend to get urinary tract infections unless they have certain risk factors, which we would always need to evaluate them for if they do come in with a urinary tract infection. The number one cause of UTIs and renal infections more generally is E. coli. Other causes include other gram-negative uh, bacilli. In young girls, a significant cause is saprophyticus. Okay, this is a very common source of infections in younger women. As I said, it's predominantly in women. UTIs in men should be followed up with, uh, with imaging uh, studies to look for anatomic abnormalities. You'd probably refer these patients to a urologist. Instrumentation is a big cause of UTI, particularly in men, because men just tend to not get UTIs unless there's something wrong. Immunosuppression and certainly obstruction, again, another big cause in men because we think of BPH. Um, so certainly there are common risk factors for men. In women, you always need to consider cervicitis because it has very similar symptoms. Um, cervicitis, one of the big things that tips that off is dyspareunia, which remember is painful intercourse. Cystitis is inflammation due to infection of the urinary bladder. The primary symptoms here are with urination. So it burns, it hurts, you're peeing often. It's really uncomfortable. However, they are not gonna have a fever. This is contained to the bladder. And they are not going to have flank pain. My med students screw this up all the time. So they think, oh, I learned about flank pain and I learned about uh, CVA tenderness and that must be with any kind of genitourinary infection. And the answer is no, 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 no. With acute cystitis, it is only gonna be urinary symptoms. They are almost never going to have a fever and they are not gonna have that CVA tenderness. Now, there is a genetic predisposition to UTI. So some women just get them and they get them often and a lot of women are just gonna come in they're gonna say, doc, I have a bladder infection and nine times out of 10, they're right. Um, we talked about the major risk factors uh, in men, BPH, catheters. Another one is anal intercourse. Now, this is important. Please pay attention to this. A lot of times we assume men who have sex with men, right? And it's true. Most men who have sex with men do engage in anal intercourse, not all of them. However, about 30 to 40 percent of heterosexual people meaning men who have sex with women, women who have sex with men exclusively, engage in anal intercourse. And they're just as much at risk, particularly men. So heterosexual men certainly engage in anal intercourse. And when they do, they're just as much at risk for UTI as men who have sex with men. So that's very important. When you're talking to a patient about, about uh, getting a sexual history, it's important to talk about sexual practices and not make assumptions based on the gender that they have sex with. Okay, that having been said, 
Um, you should always consider alternative diagnoses in a man with urinary symptoms, prostatitis, orchitis, epididymitis, and so forth. Diagnosis. Best initial test is urinalysis. You probably know this. Most accurate test is urine culture. You're going to be getting both at the same time. So urinalysis and culture. You'll probably have to order those separately on CCS. Now, what do you see on your analysis? Positive esterase, positive nitrites, white blood cells under microscopy. Now, once you've confirmed a uh, positive urinalysis for cystitis, then your next step is to get a beta HCG, obviously, if you're dealing with a woman, because the drugs that we use will be different. Most women will throw them on Bactrim, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole. However, if they are pregnant, then we must use nitrofurantoin. Pyelonephritis. This is an ascending infection. So it starts out as cystitis and then it ascends the ureters into the kidney. So they're going to have all the symptoms of acute cystitis along with flank pain, fever, chills, nausea, and vomiting because this is a, 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 an infection that goes much further. Now, why the flank pain? Because the kidneys are infected. The kidneys are in the flank. The bladder is not in the flank. That's why we don't get flank pain with cystitis. This is a much more significant infection. So you are gonna get the fever and you know all those typical signs of an infection. The way that we test this is the exact same. So you go about this the exact same way as you would go about diagnosing acute cystitis. Now, as far as treatment, we need to use slightly more um, extensive antibiotics. So if we're going to treat the patient outpatient, then we can give cefixime or ciprofloxacin. If we're treating them inpatient, we give them ceftriaxone or ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin is a good answer if you're dealing with a non-pregnant patient. Uh, however, if you're dealing with a pregnant patient, uh, then you should probably go with one of the cephalosporins. If there's no improvement in three to five days, you should get a CT scan because we're considering a perinephric abscess. This is an abscess of the kidney. It is a consequence of pyelonephritis. The major risk factor here is obstruction, which can be stones. It could be vesicular reflux. I think I pronounced that right. Or instrumentation. Symptoms, this comes on very slowly. Typically, they have a history, a recent history of urinary symptoms, but they just never got it treated. These patients are going to have the whole thing. They're going to have fever, flank pain. Um, you may be able to appreciate a mass, but not always. Um, and then they'll have those pyelonephritic symptoms that have lasted a long period of time and were, was either not treated or treated insufficiently. Again, to diagnosis, pretty much the same thing. However, if you're suspecting a perinephric abscess to formalize the diagnosis, uh, you'll at least need to get an ultrasound. However, the most accurate test is a renal biopsy. So the best initial imaging test, renal ultrasound, most accurate renal biopsy. Treatment here is ampicillin and gentamicin. There are other regimens, but this is a really good one. Um, and then you'll do surgical drainage if either the abscess is more than five centimeters, which is why we image, or there's no response to antibiotics. Okay, now finally, asymptomatic bacteriuria. Uh, this is where you get a urinalysis for whatever reason, we're doing them a lot in pregnant women, um, you get a, a urinalysis for whatever reason and it shows bacteria in the urine. In non-pregnant patients, we do not do anything. Okay? Obviously the symptoms are none. However, if she is pregnant, then we need to treat it. So the treatment is very straightforward. You're basically just treating it like a uh, like a, a urinary tract infection. Moxicillin, ampicillin, nitrofurantoin are all reasonable options. Obviously, we do not go with Bactrim because that is a folate inhibitor and it will increase the risk of neural tube defects. So uh, it is worth knowing 100,000 colony, colony forming units is the, uh, the cutoff, uh, so you should know that. Um, and then uh, in women, technically, we need to do a repeat urinalysis to establish the diagnosis. In men, you just need a single finding. Uh, however, in asymptomatic non-pregnant people, we do not treat this. We only treat it in pregnant women. And like I said, moxicillin, ampicillin, nitrofurantoin, those are all good options. And then this is just a recap of what we talked about. You can print this out if you wish.